Okay, so say we say we solve offline and like you know we we improve layout and paint and, and all of that stuff. Uh, that's that's great and all, but there's uh, another piece of the puzzle missing, and that's that's raw computation. Uh, you know, say you wanted to do something like a, a physics engine or you know real time video analysis. You know, pick out things that are in an image. You know, face recognition over like a whole audience full of people. Can we get the performance of near native code without uh, without throwing security out of the window? Well, here to say yes, and hopefully some other words, it's uh, Molly McKinley and David Sear, everyone. So it is really the last uh, talk of the day. So uh, I don't want to keep you too long, but we're going to talk to you about something we think is uh, really great, portable native client. I'm uh, David Sear. I'm the TL of the native client team. And I'm Molly McKinley. I'm the PM on the native client team. And you are getting to your drink soon, I promise, but we really appreciate your attention for this final talk of the day. So I want to start off about where Linus started off with the fact that we have a new web today. Our expectations for what you can do on the web are changing. This native app on a phone versus a native app on a computer versus a website that you're navigating to, these are all starting to merge. We aren't in the 90s anymore. Back in 1995, we had a website that was mostly tech. There were some links, you could click on some stuff, but mostly it was text, as you can see. Uh, we ended up at having a new ways to link to things. We had Yahoo, Microsoft, and even Google. It was pretty basic, our interactions we had. Fast forward to today, and we have much more rich ways of interacting with websites. Now we have interactive video editing, data visualization, ways of showing what our solar system looks like, and mapping applications. The web today is way more rich. One example, the Google Plus Photos application. This is something that you'd expect much more on desktop, in Photoshop, than in a web application you just navigate to. I'm going to start off with a fast demo, just to keep you guys from getting bored. So here, hopefully, is my lion. Let's go into the edit mode, move us over here, maybe resize our window a little bit, potentially, drag, that, that might work, perfect, okay, lion, huzzah, we can do some cool stuff like tuning our image, you can go and play with some sliders yourself or just go with what they're suggesting. You could pop or uh, moody, kind of cool. I'm, I'm always a pop person. Let's go, saturation level up. You can apply that for a little while. They also have a lot of really cool filters that you can apply just right there. Um, some of my favorites are these retro lux. I, not retro, I don't know what that really means, but they look cool. Um, so Voyager is a fun one. You can also just shuffle through it randomly until you find one you like. It's like, wow, that looks funky. OK, let's apply that. And then bam, you have a completely different image. Like, I don't know Photoshop. I would not know how to do that if you put me you know, on a native application and I had to edit this pixel by pixel. But you know, compare the images we have now. I've created a completely different and different style image than I had before. It's a really rich experience. And I think you'll all agree. 20 years ago, you would not see this on a website. Today, we're expecting a lot more. Continuing on, these native features, they're coming to our web applications. Back in the day, AutoCAD, it really could only exist on a PC. Now, there's a Chrome app for that. We're not only asking for the native capabilities in our web, we're having to ask developers to develop for many platforms. They have a C++ application an Objective-C application, a JavaScript application. They're maintaining many development stacks. Wouldn't it be great if we could only maintain one stack that could then be applied to these many different platforms? Now, that's an ideal I would like to fight for. OK, from almost the beginning, uh, people recognized, I think, the potential of the web platform. But, but the, uh, as, as Molly just described just a second ago, the web didn't really have the capability at the beginning to, to do some of these rich interactions that we wanted. So, Way back in the, uh, the mid-90s, uh, browser vendors added uh, extension platforms or extension APIs, uh, what, what in fact were uh, 
uh, things like ActiveX and, and NPAPI. These were ways to get at the underlying operating system features for things like you know, embedding a media controller so you can listen to your, uh, your CDs in those days, or, uh, or put up a, a local database server. And these were uh, ways, as I say, that give you access to some of the features that they thought were cool on the native platform by drilling through with these plugins to the underlying native uh, capabilities. Now, because these were to coding to the underlying native uh, operating system, they tended to be either uh, platform specific in the case of ActiveX or uh, things like NPAPI where you had to kind of know which platform you were going to be on. So it was going to be compiled for Windows or for Linux or for Mac, depending upon uh, which uh, browser the user happened to be running at the time, maybe a different set of browser APIs, et cetera. So this is kind of a complicated and cumbersome sort of way of, of programming these things. And so you see at about the same time uh, these uh, plugins come up that provide capabilities for getting at those underlying operating system features, but through better programming uh, approaches. So you have Java, you have uh, Flash and its uh, predecessors coming. And these are ways, again, that gave you access to some of the underlying features, such as uh, uh, canvases to draw on or uh, underlying database engines, et cetera. And much later, then you have uh, Silverlight, which is uh, giving you the capability to do this, and of course, across a, a broad spectrum of languages on the .NET framework. So this is sort of what happened uh, between uh, the 90s and, and the mid-2000s, were plugins. Now, plugins had a number of, of issues, as I'm sure you're all aware. Plugins have this user interaction where, gee, I go to a page and it says I need Flash, but I don't have Flash installed, so I get this pop-up saying I need to install Flash or I need Silverlight for this content, or I as a developer need to know, you know am I going to get to the people I want to get to if they don't have the, uh, the plugins installed? So it's kind of a, 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 an unfortunate interaction that way. And also, the plugins tended to be, well, you had what was running inside the plugin and you had what was running outside the plugin, and there was always this sort of jarring interaction between them, um, which made for sort of clunky UI if you didn't really work very hard at, uh, at isolating that uh, or not isolating that little box that uh, had your Java applet running at it from the rest of the page. And sort of most concerning of all, all of the plugin APIs provided you with direct native access to the operating system. And that made the possibility that bugs became security issues. And not just became security issues, became security issues that were prevalent just about everywhere. And just about all the plugins we see security issues uh, that have become, and this is 2009, 2010 from Symantec, become serious issues uh, for security in the web. So fast forward now to 2008. 2008, JavaScript takes a new turn. Chrome ignites the JavaScript performance spiral that we've all witnessed over the last five years. And you know the web's not been static. The browser has been growing this open web platform that has all these features we've been hearing about today and we'll hear about tomorrow. And so it's a much richer platform. So with JavaScript's performance coming up and the, the platform getting richer, a new approach to bringing native code to the web comes to the fore. And that's exemplified by Emscripten. Emscripten is you compile from native to JavaScript and run it in the web platform. And Emscripten, we think you, know, you get the, the access to the features that you're after and some of the performance, most of the performance perhaps. But there's, there are some, some uh, issues still with Emscripten. Uh, the first one is, if you're really developing a native application and it has memory management issues, for instance, de debugging a null pointer check in JavaScript is not as easy as it sounds. Um, also, if you're trying to get to all the native capabilities, for instance, threads, uh, it's not there yet. And, and furthermore, I said most of the performance. Perhaps we get to 2x, uh, within 2x of, of native performance, um, you would still like to get to the remainder of that performance. So that brings us to why are we trying to bring native code to the web? Why are we talking about bringing native code to the web? We still, as I said, we still think there's, there's better performance yet to be had from th features like threading as well as, as from that, that last 50% uh, or more and also increasing the developer options. So in this team, uh, we started the native client project. The native client project was about bringing native capabilities threads, SIMD instructions, et cetera, from the beginning, bringing performance, trying to get as close to native performance as we could get while still securely executing your application in the web browser. 
and a familiar developer model. So you can use GDB and you can, uh, if you're a native developer, you can debug in the way that you've become accustomed to developing. In addition to trying to bring all of these native capabilities and performance, we're also trying to do something really simple. We're trying to open up the web to all developers, not just developers who have been graced with the ability to learn JavaScript. Many people start out learning a C or C++ class, and they go and they build applications that are useful and interesting, and everyone wants to have access to those things, but they've been unable to bring those to the web so far, and we want to give them that opportunity. There are many different coding languages uh, that need to be brought, and we're looking forward to doing that. An example of that is the bullet physics demo that we released with Portable Native Client. Let me navigate over here. Well, maybe navigate over here. <laughs> well, you can see a sliver of it. That's something. Um, <laughs> let's expand this again. Cool. This is mostly a JavaScript application. What it's done is taken a C library, the bullet physics library, and just embed that capability in itself. Now I can interact with my Jenga thing. I'm really bad at Jenga. I've learned that through this application. Uh, and I can, as a JavaScript developer, take advantage of this C library right here on my page. And play around with some things, knock over lots of bricks. So that's one example of how we could take advantage of portable native client to bring native performance to the web and native capabilities. Now, let's say that I'm actually a C and C++ developer and that's what I'm comfortable with. All right, fine. Can also, uh, this is an example of Lua, a Lua interpreter. This is written almost entirely in C, and I can go and take this, um, take my native code, and run it right here on the web. Here I have a. Well, actually, I don't know if this is going to render very well in our weirdly. Well, donuts. That's. Yeah, who do, who doesn't like donuts here? <laughs> So this is mostly a C, a C application, and I've brought it to the web. I've brought it to all of the viewers and uh, people that can experience it there. So either way, no matter what language I develop in, I now have access to the web to bring that to all of the people to, uh, who want to interact with it. OK. So you've seen some of the things that we're trying to bring to the web. And you've seen the demonstration, in fact, of some of these things actually running in, in the web. So what is Portable Native Client? Portable native client is native code, security, platform independence. This is the web we're talking about here. We want it to run on, on these, all these platforms we talked about before, and performance. Performance as close to native as we can give you with uh, uh, security. So let's talk a little bit how about how we give you access to native. Now this touches a little bit about on Joe's presentation earlier but we're using the Pepper API in order to give you access to the native capabilities. This gives you secure access to things like USB, OpenGL, mouse cursor lock, full screen, and TCP and UDP messaging. This gives you really all of the feature set of a native application, but in a secure fashion. OK, so security, I talked about just a moment ago. So you want to put this wonderful app, uh, piece that you've put into your application. Now, this is a, a screenshot of AirMech, which is not running on Pinnacle for full disclosure, but this is the, the, the sort of thing that uh, people are doing uh, with a portable native client. So you want to put your, your piece of native code in, in the web. Well, you know, there are all these browser APIs that uh, the plugin APIs gave you access to. There are also underlying operating system APIs. And we said before that uh, you know, unfiltered access to those things was what gave rise to the security issues we've all uh, come to know and loathe. What kind of security issues? You know, going and snagging your cookies, doing something inappropriate with that, going and uh, sending your credit card number across site to some uh, malicious site, um, putting a key logger in that'll follow you for the rest of uh, your session, um, turning on your cam and watching all sorts of uh, things that you don't want the, uh, the web to know about, um, or, or scraping your screen and finding uh, you know, your bank account numbers or other things that might be up on another window. These are the kinds of things that, uh, that unfiltered API access can give you that are, that are really scary. So we're about providing access to the features that Molly just talked about, but not through unfiltered access to these APIs. So with regard to platform independence, native client from the start was x86. We added uh, ARM uh, a year or so ago. And in fact, as uh, Joe said before, you know, four of the top five Amazon laptops are, are ARM devices running Chrome OS. This is uh, something we ha have a, a very central commitment to. And we also run on the other platforms that, that uh, 
uh, the other desktop platforms that Chrome runs on, uh, Windows, Mac, Linux, Chrome OS. Now, it's really important to be platform independent, but I think you'll all agree that we want to run on every browser. Unfortunately, right now, Pinnacle is, only, is Chrome only, but if, uh, we want to have a cross-browser story as well. Now, if you're developing for native, this is kind of what your, your application structure would look like. You have your C++ file. It targets the Pepper API to get access to all of those native capabilities, which then talks to the browser and gives you the right link up. If you're making a Pinnacle application, you compile your C++ file to a portable executable, what we call a PEXI, and that talks to the Pepper API, which is included in Chrome. Now, if you want to go and run your application on another browser, you'd compile your C++ file using Inscripten into a JavaScript file. Now, that would start trying to talk to the Pepper API, but that's not implemented on another browser. We've created a solution called Pepper.js. This links up the calls in your uh, JavaScript application to the JavaScript APIs in other browsers. Now your application can go and run on multiple browsers. An example is one of our demos, Voronoi. If I go over here, here I have, yeah, not bad. I have the Voronoi application. It has all of these dots. They're running around. Um, I'm cool. can refresh it. I'm running in the Pinnacle version, so that means that I can hopefully scroll down here to the bottom. Well, hypothetically, I could scroll down to the bottom and show you that I could bump up our thread count and make this run even faster. Maybe I can still do that. Cool. Hypothetically. Fair enough. Um, always happens. Uh, another option is that I could be running that same demo right here on my Nexus tablet, which I could potentially show you using the screen, or I could just hold it up, and you could all tell. Notice, it's running. It looks wonderful. Uh, and there's lots of points, and they're animating. And I would try and do this, but I don't think it would do anything. Um, fair enough. OK, so Molly gave you the, uh, the visual demos. So here's, here's the, the boring text version of this. Uh, across a broad variety of, uh, of benchmarks that we've run, we've seen uh, overheads are actually uh, um, relative to native performance in the 80 to 90 percent range. So we're able to give you performance which is very close to native while keeping the security benefits we talked about before. So, and we're not the only ones. People have uh, in, in the, uh, the broad benchmark native client as uh, you know, being the, the, the closest sort of approach to native code performance uh, even uh, after the ASM.js announcements. So, so that's what you get, what, what do you uh, have to do to get a native client application going and what's actually going on under the hood. So you have your cool piece of source code. Um, you use our tool called Pinnacle Clang. That's part of the, uh, um, so we, we base this off the LLVM uh, tool chain. Uh, the PEXI or the portable executable is actually a modified version of LLVM bitcode that uh, has been made uh, a little better for uh, long-term use in the web. You know, once you put something up on the web, the expectation is it's going to work for a long time to come. So uh, we made some, some simplifications that make that uh, more possible. So you compile using our tool chain, and you add this. Again, we have a manifest file. The manifest file gives you a way to specify where to find the, uh, the portable executable and also a way to, uh, to specify some metadata, some things about uh, relative translation time versus uh, uh, delivered performance uh, trade-offs and uh, such things. You put an embed tag in, and boom, you have a, a page that's enabled to, uh, to run portable native client. Now your user comes and uh, starts up uh, the page that you just put up. And the browser, Chrome, is going to see, well, there's that embed tag, and it says that I'm going to be referring to a portable executable, and of course, it's portable. It's not something I can run natively on the platform, so it's going to say, I need a translation of that uh, to run on my platform. So it'll ask for a translation. The translation then is done by something called a Pinnacle Translator. Again, that's based on part of the LLVM tool chain. In this case, it's one of the, the LLVM backends. And the translator, while streaming the portable executable down, is translating the uh, uh, portable executable into something, in this case, a native ELF executable that actually runs on your platform. And running on your platform, OK, we just, I just told you all the, uh, the things with security that you want to prevent. So we use something called software fault isolation. And software fault isolation creates a region that we call a sandbox that you can guarantee that the 
executable, can only execute instructions that we've looked at, the browser has looked at, that the instructions are, are ones that are acceptable, and that they don't only refer to memory that's in the application's address range. So with that, this little piece of the, the native client technology called the validator actually validates the, those sets of uh, constraints. And with that, it can determine whether it's possible for this application to have access to these APIs that we said were, were dangerous before. And if it can't validate the executable, if it can't prove that it uh, doesn't do these bad things, then we just flat refuse to start the executable. So on the other hand, if it can, uh, show that this set of uh, um, changes to the uh, underlying instructions um, are followed, then we don't allow, we won't be able to get native access to those, unfiltered access to those APIs, and it can run safely. So if it starts running, we start it running at that point, and we start it running, all the while it's, it's running, if it wants to interact with the outside system, it interacts through something we call the, the native client runtime. And the native client runtime will also uh, enforce security policies that we can talk about in just a second. Now, you might remember, some of you, that in fact, whenever you run a web page in Chrome, that page is actually running in an outer sandbox. And so, one more thing, the native client sandbox is also running inside the Chrome sandbox. So we have sandboxes inside of sandboxes for, for the inception uh, challenge. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's, uh, um, anyway, so we have uh, sandboxes inside of sandboxes. And with this, we've crafted the cones of silence, right? So now we have two processes that, uh, that, that can't uh, talk to each other. And of course, that harkens back to PPAPI is the way that applications can securely talk to the browser and get access to these native features that the application wants and retain the security that we need for the native code. So we've told you a little bit about why we need native code in the web. We've shown the performance benefits you can get. And we've told you a little bit about how we do it, how this works under the hood. So where are we going with this next? We're trying to bring these native capabilities to the web because it enables a really rich interaction, a really rich set of applications that we believe should exist. But we're not quite done. We want to keep improving on our techniques on how we get these applications up and running. I'm going to give you a little bit of an analogy in explaining our future directions on how to make this even better. First off, we want to speed up your Lion. We want to increase your translation time. A user navigates to your page that's running a pinnacle, pinnacle executable. It should load as quick as we can make it. We also want to make you even more capable. Give your Lion some claws. We're going to give, your C++, give you both C++ exception handling and vectorized instructions in Pinnacle. We're also going to decrease the size of your Pinnacle bitcode so that your page can load and it'll download over those crappy connections we've been talking about all day as quickly as we can. Finally, we really want to be responsive to you, our developer community, and moving forward and figuring out what are the things that you need in order to make this the next rich platform and next way to make really amazing applications. Thank you so much for your time. Please visit gonatural.com if you have any questions. I'm not going to hold you any longer. Go. Five minutes early, have some drinks, and please come and chat with us. We'll be right up here. Uh, thank you so much for today. It's been wonderful. And cheers.